And joining me here in the studio, we have Hyun Ma, a assistant professor at Frostburg State University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joanna. So, you know, a lot of numbers here, three continents, 60 plus countries, 30% of the world's gross domestic mm -hmm. product. A lot of numbers, as we mentioned, but what does this really mean to all the countries that are involved in this initiative? Well, if I can summarize, uh, if you look at Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the larger contribution China can make uh, includes, the first one, I would say uh, industrialization, or upgrade industrialization, especially for medium-sized country, from Africa to Central Asia to Southeast Asia. Uh, the second contribution this uh, Belt and Road Initiative can make is uh, to uh, through a peace to achieve prosperity. That's the Chinese experience. So China want to export this experience to all countries, basically to show them, you know, look, China, you know, after 1978, no civil war, no domestic conflict, no, you know, war with other foreign countries. So that's basically set a good example. Uh, the third area I think China can make is basically uh, try to uh, tell all these countries, you really need to learn how to cooperate because China really benefited from cooperating with all countries. Uh, from 1979, both Western countries, Eastern countries, no matter what kind of ideology, as long as you can cooperate, you really can benefit. That's the general lessons I think Chinese can really teach to other countries. And then specifically, of course, every country have different uh, context, uh, different needs, so that's why if you look at Central Asia, China probably can contribute more to agricultural development. Uh, Southeast Asia probably can contribute more to uh, industrial development, uh, tourism. Uh, in the ocean, especially Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka want to build as kind of transportation center in, in the ocean, so that's why China need to expand all these Sri Lanka uh, port facilities. And of course, other countries, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia as a, uh, a less industrialized country, uh, really want China to help them to build industry zone. Uh, Egypt, huge population, right? So China want to build new cities for Egypt. And Iran probably is another case that I think really, you know, deserve our attention. Because every country mm -hmm. is different. They're all right. different sizes. They all have different needs. And when a lot of people first hear about Belt and Road, mm -hmm. they think it's just infrastructure, but it's really much, much larger than that. Yeah, I would just say, uh, if you look at all this so-called, you know, five connectivity, include policy, trade, I think this is a framework. But under this framework, every country, every region, every continent, you really have a specific demand. So that's why, as I said, if you look at Central Asia, probably they need more agricultural development, and they need to upgrade uh, old Soviet-style industry, right? In the ocean, as I mentioned, they need more um, port construction, expansion. So that's what they need. And Iran, as I said, after being sanctioned many years by Western country, you need almost everything need to be upgraded. So that's why China built uh, metro station, railways, everything possibly in future even uh, airplanes. So that's why every country is different. But uh, the basic foundation, I would say, uh, one belt and one road initiative set up is basically set up framework. There. And in this framework, every country, every you know, region can have their, their own demand. Is there a common need that glues all of these countries mm -hmm. together other than just China? I would say probably uh, it's more like uh, infrastructure transportation, because if you look at China's uh, one belt, one road initiative, it's more like expanded industrialization. If you think about 18th century, 19th century industrial revolution, right, you have to build basic infrastructure, you have to build railways, but now China connected all regions, all countries beyond China. So that's why I would say this is a second probably industrial revolution after first industrial revolution. It's more like upgraded, it's more like globalized. So that's why, as I mentioned, many countries are from Egypt to Iran to Indonesia to Kazakhstan, they really want to improve their industrial capacity. So that's why, uh, in this sense, I would say this is a truly global globalization, not Western globalization or uh, Chinese globalization. That's a global globalization. What are you going to look for as the Belt and Road Forum gets underway in Beijing in just a few days? What are you watching for? Uh, I would say if you look at uh, this summit, probably Chinese leaders and other leaders will set up some uh, rules and the laws, for example, they talk about a policy coordination. Then probably you have kind of, you know, communicate and talk about basic policies, right? And also probably they have some kind of uh, facility connection. If you think about, for example, railways in Central Asia, China, you have different railways, right? Probably you have to standardize, right? 
then uh, Southeast Asia basically the same. And also probably they will set up some joint uh, project uh, to invite all partners to invest not only China, because you really you know, don't want to say, oh, China dominate all this investment. You need other countries as well to contribute what they can do. So that's why you have kind of you know, be lying, right? So that's the thing I think uh, probably China and other country will pursue. Uh, last, I think, is probably China want to show all these countries participate. You know, this is not really Chinese uh, hegemonic practice. Uh, China treat every country, every people, every culture basically equally. So basically try to avoid historical colonialism and imperialism. So that's the image I think China really tried to project it to all these uh, leaders. All right, Professor, thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate it. All right.